Welcome back to Watchbox Studios. I'm Tim and thanks for logging on. We've got a fun show tonight. I think we've actually got one of our most engaging in quite a while. I've also got some really cool things potentially to give away, as this little piece of acrylic anatomy right next to me could be yours. So we're going to have more details on that in a moment, our Bird Valle Horological Sculpture giveaway. But first I want to join some of my friends in the chat box, Scott Hockenberry, Mozart Reveal, Eric Cecil, Ryan H., PY7. Thanks for joining me, guys. All right, let's jump straight into it tonight. You guys know that the best place to buy, trade, and sell your watches is on the watchbox.com. And as a matter of fact, if you check the description field, there is a link in our description field so you can actually enter to win this wonderful acrylic head full of watch parts. We're going to do a quick wrist shot and close up of that because I want you to know exactly what you could get by downloading our app and visiting our social media as well as clicking the link. Well, you can see I've got my own horological sculpture right behind, but this wonderful piece by New York-based artists Bird Valle can be yours. Beautifully made with Swiss watch parts that have kind of reached the end of their effective life and utility on the bench. This is actually one of several sculptures available, and I believe we are giving away a skull, but they have several sculptures available. Bird Valle, definitely check that out. We're big fans of the brand and what they do. And by the way, if you've seen some of my interviews, then you know when I do the interviews, the glasses go right here. Okay, so let's talk about tonight's batting practice. This or that, I love it, don't get me wrong, but I feel we need to mix it up a little bit. Now, warming up your monitor, your pitches and my cuts. Okay, Lang versus Langa, let's know the difference. Uh, okay, first things first, Brian Goffberg, I have to admit, is not helping matters by calling Langa Lang. I love him, but that's one thing that has definitely confused our viewers. So, let's break it down. Alanga Unzona, they make watches like the Zeitberg. That was the unveiling of the brand in 1994. They make watches like the Zeitwerk today, and they also make the Longa One, they make the Datagraph, they're well known. They are arguably the most influential modern German watch brand in terms of style and impact. Uh, of course, Walter Longa reestablished them in 1990 as soon as the wall fell. They were purchased by Richemont around the turn of the millennium. They make about 5,000 watches per year out of Glasuta, and of course, they pioneered what we call German watch movement style today. They've also pioneered things like the Panorama Datum, which everyone in German watchmaking has copied, the engraved balance cock, which has been copied by everyone from Glossuta Original to Nomos in some of its high-end models. But they are not Lang. That's a different company. Now, Lang and Heine, or Lang und Heine, I should say, is a cottage-level operation run by AHCI luminary Marco Lang. So he is quite literally the Lang in Lang and Heine. And there he is among the other superstar glitterati watchmakers of our era. You can see Beat Haldeman in there. You can see F.P. Jorn. You can see Sven Anderson. They are all there along with Kerry, Andreas Streller, Peter Speakmarin. The point is this guy matters. So they make beautiful watches like the Albert Mono Pusher Chronograph, and if you haven't considered this, you really should. Also, they make beautiful movements that manage not to be derivative. I mentioned that Longo was very influential in terms of creating the style we call German watch finish. Well, some of those norms are recapitulated here, but quick note, that movement is executed on mammoth ivory. That's right. It's not a sight species. You can use mammoth ivory to make a movement, and Marco Lang did. So incredibly inventive on both sides of the watch. The company's based in Dresden. Everything is made in-house, down to the screws and the hair springs. And they make about 80 to 100 watches in a really good year. It's Marco, his family, and a couple of close associates. So a small operation, but that gives you the opportunity to get to know your watchmaker and also to customize. They make a lot of cool stuff, and by the way, Marco's father, Rolf, still practicing, himself a watchmaker. All right, dun 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 dun, -dun. Let me tell you a little bit more about our Bird Valle giveaway, because I know there are a lot of questions here. Okay, download our app, visit us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, visit and follow us on Facebook, watch the Watchbox doc, visit our website, visit Bird Valle, and sharing with friends. Of course, I'm going to post the link so you guys can sign right up in the chat box, because I know no one's going to look at the description field. So I'm just going to put this straight in right now, guys. Click it, enter. This thing, by the way, is handmade, artisanally crafted, and worth over $2,500, so it is something you'll want to win. That said, let's get back to our batting practice. Okay, from Roy P., Tim, please detail practitioners of the finest finish beyond the blue chip names. Enough with Dufour, Voudelain, and 
R.W. Smith, and Grubel Forsey. While I love all of the above, you're right, there's a lot more to the world of high horology finish and artisanal detailing of movements and cases than those guys. So let's talk about Romain Gautier. Okay, out of the Valley de Jeu, he's not a watchmaker. He's actually a machinist engineer who started a watch company in 2006. The HM, hour and minute, was his first model, but it was really the logical one of 2013 that blew the lid off public awareness of Romain Gautier. Now, the finishing style has panache, detail, beautiful broad bevels that you don't need a loop to look at. The even black polishes his proprietary screws. This is an entirely different level of finish executed to the same standards of Grubel Forcey, Carrie Voudelainen, or, since we're local to the Valley du Jeu with this, Philippe Dufour. You need to consider Romain Gautier if you are looking for high horology finish. Executed perfectly from a company that makes 50 to 100 watches a year, you can't go wrong. Also consider Lang and Heine, or Lang und Heine. You can't go wrong there, and we just saw why. Now, Grunefeld, okay. The Horological Brothers out of Holland. They cut their teeth working for Audemars Piguet, Renault, et Papy, so the pedigree is impeccable. The important thing is that their watches feature more than finishing beauty. Original style, and if we can get a little bit closer here, maybe go full screen with this, they have media blasted center bridges with relieved bevels. So you have a raised outer portion that is then hand beveled. All of that executed with stainless steel bridges. So they're working with styles that they invented and materials that literally no one else dares touch. It's not easy to finish stainless steel. These guys do it, and with virtuosity. They still run a racket finishing parts for Renault et Papi. So while they build their own watches out of their factory in the Netherlands, they're also still doing work for Audemars Piguet, Renault et Papi. That's how good these guys are. Now, Crador. This is a company brand within a brand. So you have Seiko, you have Grand Seiko, and then you have Crador, the absolute apex, effectively head of gold adapted from French. It's been around since 1969, but it's really become Crador as we know it today since 2006 when the Grand Sonnerie debuted, the Spring Drive Grand Sonnerie, the watch you see right here. This is a watch that is finished using all of the standards as well as many of the techniques that Crador's artisans from the Seiko Micro Artist Studio went over to the Valet de Jeu to learn from Philippe Dufour. They even brought swatches of the same grass and brush used to finish Philippe Dufour's bridges. So they took it quite literally while executing the actual style of the bridges in their own distinctive fashion. And there's a lot of imagery that is redolent of the region in which the watch is made, baked into the design of those bridges. Definitely check uh, Crador, Grand Sonnerie, bridge design, if you want to see all of the animals, the flora and the fauna and the landscapes that are actually incorporated into the style of those bridges. So, uh, Aaron Beche, this is a guy out of Hungary who really needs to be considered and on your radar. If you're patient, because he makes five to ten watches a year, and if you have impeccable taste, he is going to be right up your alley. It helps if you have a little bit of a sensibility for the Baroque because he does all of his own finishing, freehand engraving, and garnishing. As you can see, the watch, in this case the uh, Primus Tourbillon, is beautifully executed, maybe even a little bit Rococo. Forget Baroque, this is Rococo, but all done in-house in his manufacture in Hungary. He has two basic models, and again, he's nowhere near a dozen watches a year just yet. But if you want the highest level of finish and a super personal relationship with your watchmaker, Aaron Beche. Now, of course, I want to include that he has some superb details included into these watches. So we've got the macro image. I think we have some superb details to show you. When you get really close, this is as good as anything being executed in Le Chaux de Fonds at Grubel Forcey or by Philippe Dufour and Romain Gautier in the Vallée du Jeu. This is done in Hungary. Aaron Beche. Beautiful stuff. Now, I would be remiss not to acknowledge that there are others. There's Bayat Haldeman. There's Keaton Mayrick working in the U.S. There is Pascal Coignon out of France and even Acrivia uh, out of Geneva. So there are other companies that do work on this level. We just don't have time for all of them. Now, Chan Park asks me a relatively straightforward question, and I have a straightforward answer. Tim, please name your top three alarm watches available today. 
Spoiler alert, Jajer Lekult's not on the list, because in terms of innovation, these three take the cake. Since 2003, the Ulysse Norden Sonata, previewed in 2003, launched for the 2004 model year. This is the minute repeater of alarms. Now, of course, Patek Philippe's Grandmaster Chime 6300 does have an alarm. I'm disqualifying that because that's real estate, not a watch. This you can actually buy. This has a regulator, minute repeater style, to slow down the chimes. And the chimes themselves and the strikers are tuned to produce the same musical quality you get from a minute repeater. Moreover, the alarm can be set in 24-hour format, so it knows the difference between 12 midnight and 12 noon. And it can be set somewhat uniquely in a countdown format so you can count down if you want to set the alarm to go off in two hours as opposed to trying to figure out what time it'll be in two hours and then setting the alarm to that. You can set the watch in a countdown format for good measure, and I think this is great for a travel-friendly complication like the alarm. The watch has a GMT built in and a very friendly one at that. So my first favorite alarm. Okay. Something completely unique released at Basel World 2010, the Glasuta Original. Senator Diary. Now what you're looking at here, and if we go full screen, you'd see it really well. There is a alarm subdial that lets you set a calendar. So you can set the time in, in 24 hour format. You have that ability, like on the UN, but you also have the ability to set the watch up to 31 days in advance. So it's truly a alarm reminder in the strictest sense. This is great for not forgetting birthdays and anniversaries because you can set the calendar and the time rather than just the time. Moreover, if you do have to do any gymnastics with the date setting, either because the watch stops or because there's an irregular length month, Month, the alarm setting will adjust commensurately. So I love that piece, and I think it is probably the most sophisticated alarm on the market today. Now, Blancpain, the Revive GMT, this came out in 2004, still quite sophisticated. It offers a number of refinements that I think are both travel friendly, in that it has a 24 hour GMT and an alarm, as well as fairly refined. It has a power reserve for the alarm so you know when it's wound. You won't accidentally depend on it when it's not ready to chime. It has an on-off function for the alarm. And this is something you hardly ever see. The automatic winding system of the watch winds both the watch and the alarm. So once it sounds, it will start re-energizing itself. It also features appropriate high horology finish and thanks to screw down crowns and pusher adjusters, 100 meter water resistance you can see this one that we had back in the watch you want days. This is a very versatile watch, an all-around sports dress timepiece. A great candidate, if you're that guy who wants an only one watch, this could be your only one watch. So those are my three favorite alarms. Am I right? Am I wrong? Tell me in the chat box. I will say the alarm I would buy for myself right now is the late, great JLC Master Memovox Boutique with the Snowdrop dial. But then again, I own the vintage Snowdrop and I'm a JLC fanboy. I like blue dial watches, so that's kind of right up my alley. But the most sophisticated, it is not. All right, I can see Hellbop finally joining us live. This dude is always live in the chats. He's always commenting. He's been a longtime supporter. I am so happy to see him in there. PY7 saying hello. Ryan H saying hello. I can see Eric Cecil. And I can see bump, 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 bump. Adam J. Odell. Let's see, Hatchy Zenke. Okay, so Adam J. Odell saying, Tim, how about a car this or that for a future episode? We're mixing it up. We're moving the, the standard this or that out of circulation. We're going to bring it back as appropriate, but I think a car this or that would be super. So he's asking, Porsche GT4, so a Cayman GT4, or a 911-997 manual. A 997-2 manual with a paint-to-sample color like Etna Blue would be my choice. But that's, my, that's me. That's me. I like the 911, I'm a purist, and I like paint to sample colors, because I like color. Also, Etna Blue is pretty close to this shirt, and I love this shirt. Bump, 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 bump. I will also say that we have Hachisenki saying, too many, I, I can't say that word, but difficult and garrulous folks with an attitude are driving 997s. You're not wrong. I was once warned by a high school English teacher who, who told... All of the women in her class don't date a guy who drives a Porsche because he'll be obsessed with the car and ignore you. She wasn't wrong, in my experience. Okay, continuing with tonight's program, I want to remind you to stay online with me when the broadcast ends. Follow Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Do this in a separate window. Open up another tab. Keep streaming with me, but you will like what I post. It's all of my sensibility, which means the watches are big and colorful and fun and vibrant. 
Okay, wrist shots. I asked and you answered. Riley G shares his Rolex 16700. This is an original GMT Master. The model endured until the year 1999, and he's sharing it trackside at Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas, which is the home of the U.S. Grand Prix. This was the last of the single time zone Rolex GMT Masters in the mold of the Pan Am original, and his has a gorgeous tritium dial and Pepsi bezel. Okay. Paul A. ups the ante in a big way with his personal Lotus 11 Series 2, which is at right in the image. He's got some fine road cars in the background. And at left, a car I could not guess because I had never seen it, a Brabham BT8 with a BRM V8 and a six-speed transaxle that revs to 10,000 RPM. I was thinking early Lola T70. He was asking me if I knew what it was. I don't have a photographic memory of things I've never seen before, and I have never seen that. Now, uh, that BT8, interesting backstory, was actually driven by the late Blackjack Brabham Grand Prix World Championship champion, driven himself to a podium at Goodwood's Easter Monday race in 1964. He finished just behind Jackie Stewart, who was second. I'll also say, Paul, I have only memories of cars I've seen, but I will say this. Can you name this car that I watched race to victory in the Grand Prix of Washington, D.C. in 2002, driven to victory over the Le Mans winning Audi R8s? I'll give you a hint. Paul, this watch was driven by Jan Magnussen, father of F1's Kevin Magnussen, and David Brabham, whose dad you've probably heard of. That was my personal sports car racing memory. Okay, Brent J. gets us back on track, pun intended, with his Omega Railmaster 135004. This was built one year before that Brabham BT-8 in 1963. A gorgeous, true vintage piece, immaculately preserved, lovely dial, unretouched, truly special piece. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. All right, viewer mail and questions. So tonight, remember, comment if you're watching this. If you're watching it live, comment in the descriptions if you're watching it recorded, and please subscribe. Also, I'm taking live questions, so come at me as, well, yeah, I can see if Steve Bowden is saying, I named that car Jingoism. That was the Panos LMP1 Roadster S. They went with a bit of a Captain America color scheme for 2002. It was corny, but having the NASCAR-powered car win on the streets of D.C. next to a bunch of Virginia-based NASCAR fans watching sports car racing for the first time ever, it was good PR for the world of Le Mans racing. Okay. So, Ludovic S. asks, Hi, Tim. For all that's written about tourbillon watches, it seems that there's online disagreement about whether a tourbillon is even a grand complication, a complication, or something else entirely. Is there a proper way to classify a tourbillon in a wristwatch? Okay. First, there is no consensus on this matter. Let me be totally clear. Very reputable people who I revere and respect do not agree on this. I had a discussion about uh, grand complications at SIHH and whether tourbillons figure with Audemars Piguet company historian and watch expert Michael Friedman. You may have seen him if you were at SIHH. He did the briefing and the press presentation for Audemars Piguet. So he indicated that AP's position is that tourbillon escapements do not contribute to Audemars Piguet's designation of a grand complication wristwatch or pocket watch. And moreover, he does not consider a tourbillon to be a complication, but a refinement. Here's an example of the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Grand Complication. It's reference 26552. It does not include a tourbillon. It's a minute repeater, a chronograph, and a perpetual calendar. So by that definition he gives, consider that a Gere Lecoult gyro tourbillon, a twin axis tourbillon that costs $400,000, officially only has a power reserve complication because this has the tourbillon and a power reserve display. The tourbillon doesn't count. It's a refinement. So this is officially a $400,000 power reserve by that definition. Moreover, due to to do justice to the logic, and I think you have to, you can't treat this as a straw man argument, um, a tourbillon is like a Breguet overcoil. So it's something that's implemented as a refinement to promote accuracy. And you could say the same of a fusée and chain, which, which is basically there for the same reason, to ensure constant torque to the escapement, thus ensuring better timekeeping. And a direct impulse escapement, of which you're looking at the AP escapement right there, AP makes one of those too, which is designed to reduce parasitic losses in the escapement architecture. All of these things are refinements, not complications. So that's 
if you want to do justice to this argument from Michael Friedman. I would also say, according to this view, Patek Philippe, which in the 1980s built the prototype 3615, that was the first Patek Philippe grand complication wristwatch, would not have offered a true grand complication wristwatch until the 5208P of 2011, because that was a minute repeater, a chronograph, and a perpetual calendar. It does not have a tourbillon, but it was the first to combine all those features in a Patek Philippe wristwatch. So, other than the 3615 of the 1980s, this would have been Patek's first grand complication. Yes, even considering stuff like the 5074 and the 5016. So here's the opposing view, and one I personally share. A tourbillon is a complication. I believe that a tourbillon cannot be compared to a bare refinement. There's a lot more going on here than a Breguet overcoil. I would say objectively, it complicates the movement immensely. Whereas direct impulse systems, over overcoils, and dual impulse systems don't necessarily add an immense amount of parts complexity to a movement. It might not dramatically increase the amount of parts in the movement or the complexity of the movement. Those are definitely refinements. I put the tourbillon in a different category because the sheer amount of mechanism involved. Also, I would argue that systems like the Fusée and Chain or F.P. Journe's preference, also shared by Langa, which is the Remontoir de Galité, these constant force systems are sufficiently complex to engineer and assemble that I do consider them complications because of what they bring to the watch on that level. I would also say, by definition, these complicate the watch even if they aren't separate functions. I think you can distinguish a function from a complication. A fusée and a chain is not a function. A tourbillon is not a function. I do believe it's a complication. And finally, Osvaldo Patrizzi, noted watch collector, vintage watch expert, and founder of the auction house Antecorum, explicitly stated during his active career in watches that he considered a tourbillon to be a complication. So at least I have some backup from the world of people who are more professional than I am. So not helping the situation, Patek Philippe has an entire collection of watches, basically anything above the level of a simple chronograph or an annual calendar that they describe as grand complications. Okay, not strictly true. All the same, humor them, they're Patek, they can get away with it. What do you guys think? Is a tourbillon a complication? Vertical Mind is saying, a complication adds a function. I can see Alvin joining us from Singapore. Welcome, Alvin, and good morning. And I can see that Peter B. saying, zero-G tourbillon looks complicated. He's talking about the new Zenith that came out at Basel World this year. I would agree, but that's not a tourbillon. That's a gimbaled escapement. I consider it a complication, but it's a gimbaled escapement. It is not a rotating carriage escapement. It is not a tourbillon. Uh, I can see bump, 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 that PY7 is saying his sunglasses are on that skull thing. There's a reason for that. We're giving it away. You can actually check the description below our video and click the link to enter. You can earn bonus points by following our social media or downloading our Watchbox app on thewatchbox.com. We're going to draw after 31 days and someone is going to win one of these Bird Vallée horological sculptures. This acrylic anatomy, beautifully hand polished, hand finished, executed in their New York atelier, filled with watch parts that have reached the end of the line. So after the bench, Alas, I knew him well. But the bottom line is, these horological afterthoughts have found new life in a beautiful acrylic skull that could be yours. Retail value, $2,700. Unlike my free hats, this you will not want to miss because there will not be another one. So join in. And I can see right here, Jonathan Syriac is asking, hey, Tim, what does Grand Seiko and Seiko Spring Drive add exactly? I can see Rich Buddy, by the way, saying, I think a tourbillon is a complication. It's like a seconds hand. And Bruno G saying, I believe a tourbillon is a complication. <coughs> Pardon me, guys. Sometimes I outstrip my own capacity to generate spittle to wet my throat. Okay. So, like I was saying, spring drive. It's not a complication. It's a different type of movement. Spring drive is a combination of a mechanical drivetrain with a quartz oscillator. The mechanical drivetrain turns a little dynamo that generates an induced electric current, and that induced electric current activates the quartz oscillator, which regulates a continuously spinning regulator wheel. The regulator wheel slows or increases the speed of the spring drive system 
to govern the watch. So there's no battery, there's no capacitor, there's no charging, all the energy comes from the spring. But what spring drive really is, is a conversion of spring potential energy to mechanical, thank you, my guys, how good are they? To mechanical kinetic energy to an induced electric current, so electric energy. Uh, that's what spring drive is. It's effectively a very elaborate energy conversion system that ultimately is powered by a spring and ends with a quartz oscillator. Okay, so bump, 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 bump. Also, I see Kevin see, saying, I don't understand why some people spend six figures on a tourbillon when you could get one from Asia for under $1,000. Well, I mean, you can get a hand-drawn sketch at a carnival for five bucks. You want to buy a Picasso hand sketch, it's going to cost you more. The question is, how special is the product you're receiving and what does it mean to you? How emotionally invested are you in the product? And realistically, how much skill went into creating it? Yeah, you can buy a Seagull or a Memorigen Torbion, but is it exactly the same thing as buying one from, I don't know, Aaron Beche, who we saw at the beginning of the show? I don't think it is. I think it's an emotional distinction and an artisanal distinction, but if you're already into the world of luxury watches, I probably don't need to explain this to you. Okay, bump, 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 bump. Back to the schedule. Interesting question inspired by George Mayer, who's our director of sales here at Govberg Watchbox, and also Wei Ko, who's the founder of men's style magazine, The Rake, and probably better known to us in the watch fraternity, Revolution Magazine. So we had a discussion over dinner about the most innovative watches of the last half decade. So here with my take. Now, George said that the FP Journe Vagabondage 3 was the most innovative watch the last five years. I happen to disagree. To me, the V3 is the V2, which was a jump hour and jump minute with the, well, it, it's, it's effectively the, the V2, as you can see right there, with a jumping seconds complication added. Now, I have strong feelings about this. Because F.P. Journ already had deadbeat second systems that were fed by a Remontoir de Galité. If you're familiar with the Remontoir Tourbillon, his first watch built under his own name, his first wristwatch, then you know that he had the deadbeat second system a long time ago. If you take that deadbeat hand and you replace it, you just put a disc with the numbers on top of that extended pinion, you get a jumping seconds complication. So for me, this was not a path beyond mechanically for F.P. Journe. This was a refinement of his deadbeat seconds to look like continuous jumping seconds. And it is that. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying that's not a landmark watch. I think the V2 was the landmark watch. Now here's my most influential watches of the last half decade. Purely my opinion, but I'm going to back it up because on the basis of influence, the impact they had, relevance to collectors and the industry, imagination and disruptive potential to the industry, that's why you're not going to see, for instance, something that's virtuosity in engineering, like the Audemars Piguet Super Sonnery, which will blow your eardrums out. It's a minute repeater and a sonnery that will blow your eardrums out with its volume. It's not on this list because of limited relevance. Uh, it's just not that relevant or influential to the industry right now. And the JLC Gyro Tourbillon series, which is mind-blowing work from an engineering and watchmaking standpoint, I just don't think it's that relevant to the mainstream collector, and I don't think it disrupted the industry. I haven't seen much influence either. There's only a couple of multi-axial tourbillons, and we haven't really seen too many of them since Thomas Pressure built the first one in the late 90s. So hereby, Tim's choices. Zenith DeFi Lab, 108,000 vibrations per hour, or 15 hertz. This is a watch that is the realization of something that you could argue has been in the works since the original 1960 Bulova Accutron, which is a harmonic oscillator that supersedes all previous mechanical escapements by finding the natural frequency of a unit. In Accutron, it was electrically powered and it was a tuning fork. Here, it's spring powered and it's a silicon unit that oscillates at, as one piece. It sounds like a very subtle rattle if you hold it against the ear. So this is essentially a full mechanical version of what Bulova did with the Accutron, a mechanical oscillator with a natural frequency that achieves phenomenal vibration levels so it can effectively achieve 0.3 seconds per day of deviation. I believe this technology 
which was also attempted by Debathun with Resinique and Vaucher Manufacture with the Sunfine system. This will change the industry. This will be the end of a lot of watchmaker manufactured watches. And you will see this on the luxury horology side, expensive watches that are exclusive, as I define it, rather than high horology, because a lot of these parts pop out of industrial production processes. I think those processes used to make the parts, as well as the idea of the silicon oscillator itself, will find their way through watches costing as little as $5,000 within uh, the blink of an eye. And I think Zenith will be the first to commercialize it. They've already been the first to sell it. Ten pieces were made in the initial run. I think anyone will be able to buy this technology from Zenith for ten grand in two years. Okay, the Panerai ID Lab PAM700. Four jewels, full synthetic movement, 50-year service interval, 50-year warranty. That is meaningful technology from a service standpoint. If you save a $1,200 service every three years for the life of this watch, the price almost starts to make sense, and the price is $50,000. This is another technology that I think will immensely disrupt the industry and change everything we currently know and assume about the service intervals of luxury watches. Again, I think this will start expensive, exclusive, and as far as I know, Unveiled in 2017, not one has made it to a customer's hand yet. This is the technology of the future. Possibly a leg up on Panerai, however, Breitling. And they did it a year before Panerai at Basel World 2016. I was there. I saw the prototype. This is the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage Chrono Works. They only made a handful of them. 100 pieces, $40,000, all ceramic. This was Breitling's first full ceramic case, but that's not the innovative part. It features a full ceramic caliber BC01. It's the B01 caliber with ceramic bridges and plates. The silicon or synthetic wheels insert directly into the ceramic bridges. So there are no pivot jewels for the drivetrain of the watch. The chronograph function has pivot jewels and the balance has pivot jewels, but not for the drivetrain of the watch. You also have an escapement that is entirely unlubricated silicon. You have a balance that is multi-material based on silicon and metal with a perfectly even, basically zero coefficient of thermal expansion, so resistant to temperature-induced timing deviations. The barrel itself was thinned out, and the barrel is dry lubricated with a DLC internal coating that allowed Breitling to achieve a 100-hour power reserve rather than the bo one standard 70. And finally, there was a sprung tooth seconds pinion for the chronograph system. So the sprung teeth effectively reduce all of the play in the, in the seconds hand. So what you wind up with is an immensely innovative set of technologies all working in tandem. I picked this over the Zenith. Defi El Primero 21, the 1 100th of a second Fougeron with two escapements, and the JLC Extreme Lab 2 in all its iterations. This is revolutionary technology that will find its way into mainstream watches. FP Journe Elegant 48, my choice for the most innovative and disruptive FP Journe over the Vagabondage 3. And the reason is because it blew up all of our assumptions about how a men's watch is supposed to be made. The Elegant started as F.P. Journe's ladies watch. The tonneau case was made larger for male use. It is a quartz watch. It features a fully loomed dial. The dial is a big block of loom. The quartz caliber is a lifetime serviceable Swiss quartz with gold bridges, not a disposable electronic component. It has a shelf life of 18 years battery capacity because it actually shuts itself down and stops ticking when it's not being used for half an hour. When picked up, it remembers the time, it reorients the hands, and it resumes ticking. This blew up all conceptions about men's watches and quartz. This is the best deal in F.P. Journe's catalog, and I'd say it's one of the three F.P. Journe watches I would most like to own. Bold, making a men's quartz watch, making it non-round, and deriving it from a lady's watch rather than the other way around, with lifetime serviceability and real luxury horology cred. Finally, Resence. This is a watch that's hot off the presses, still a prototype, but this is the Type 2 E-Crown. Every generation has had its mechatronic watch. In the 50s, we had the original Hamilton Electric Caliber 500. Mechanical drivetrain and balance with an impulse system and a timing system based on electronics and contacts. In the 60s, we had a mechanical drivetrain with a transistorized system called Accutron, which used the tuning fork acting as a servo and a transistor to time it. In the 70s, we started to see the beginning of mecha 
chronographs. First with the Omega Speed Sonic, which was a tuning fork movement with a Dubois de Praz mechanical chronograph on top, and we saw mechatronic chronographs in the 80s and 90s with quartz bases and conventional vertical clutch chronograph modules. And then in the 2000s, we saw Seiko and Grand Seiko with the spring drive system. But here with Resence, we have something that offers real benefits, a mechanical watch that can continuously update itself based on remote signals. So it's a radio watch. It's an atomic clock watch. It can store two different times in the electronic module, which you're looking at. So it's a GMT. It can also open shutters automatically to solar charge the module if it runs low on power. You can also use the, it can also be wound by the mechanical winding system of the watch. You can also run the watch even if the electronics fail entirely. Again, check out Resence's eCrown subsite. They have a special website for this system, but you're going to see this at every level of luxury horology in the future. It's not for me. I don't want this. I want an all-mechanical watch, but this is the future. This has disruptive potential. Okay, now, honorable mention, Tudor Heritage Black Bay, because true Others pioneered the retro-styled re-edition watch, but Tudor opened the floodgates with this in 2013. This is effectively the crest of the retro re-edition watch craze we're living in right now. We're surfing that wave, and this is the crest. Also, Romain Gautier, Logical One, rethought everything about finish, about design, reimagined the ancient, almost middle-age derived fuse and chain constant force system using a short jeweled chain and a snail cam. You wind the watch by pushing a button. It pioneered new standards of finish and materials we were not used to seeing inside Valet de Joux watches. All that, you can still get your mirrored beveling and enamel dial, the logical one of 2013 a revolutionary watch. And I will say, the Ulysse Norden Freak Vision, which came out this year at SIHH and is effectively, I wish this were whiskey, it'd be so much cooler. Uh, it, it, this is the, effectively the realization of many of the features from last year's Freak Innovision 2 concept watch. All right, moving on, wrist shots. I asked and you answered. Martin N. reminds us that Pepsi GMTs resurfaced in the modern era with the 2014 white gold BLRO. And here is his now discontinued watch made from 14 to 17. That is a collectible modern Rolex. Ryan M. eschews fast race cars and pilots watches with his sunburst gray dial Seiko Turtle. And we're happy to see it. We love all watches here. Also, Oscar gets us back up to speed with his Breitling Navitimer, and what I'm guessing is a Generation 3 or 4 Dodge Viper or SRT Viper. Very nice. Thanks for sharing. All right, guys. Live viewer questions. Kevin C., should Rolex make a red bezel sub? I guess anything could happen, but that's kind of just picking colors from a hat at this point. I would say I expect the next big innovation in colorful subs to be a hybrid of the Kermit and the Hulk. I think we're going to see the black dial of the Kermit, the original 2003 anniversary sub, with a green serochrome bezel and a super case as seen on the Hulk. And I think you're going to see it with a 32-35 70-hour movement, and I think you're going to see it next year. That's my prediction for the next big thing in colorful subs. I would also say that you guys should definitely stay online with me for more commentary and fun and fabulous watches on the most colorful watch page on Instagram. If we can go full screen, guys, this is my personal Instagram. I like to make the watches big and vivid, an extension of my own imagination, almost surreal. I love colors, I love three dimensions, and I love turning the watches into superheroes. They are for me, I hope they are for you. So stay tuned with me, Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. And remember, if you're watching this recorded, go down to the description box, click the link, and enter to win our Bird Valle Horological Sculpture. I'm gonna take those back from my friend right there. I'm Tim, this is Watchbox, and thanks for logging on.